Good afternoon and hello everybody. I hope that you are as happy, as excited, and as willing to listening to everything that we have prepared for you today. Welcome to our Virtual South Summit, and today we are talking about Industry 4.0. For me, it's a topic very close to my heart because we know that we need this to build our future. Welcome everybody, welcome to all our participants today, welcome to, to everybody who is connected, connected from their home, and I hope that you will enjoy a very good day with us. Today, as you know, in all our Virtual South Summits, we have a very good combination between the perspective from startups, perspective from corporations, and uh, the experience of, and competition with all our entrepreneurs for this year. So don't miss a second of it. Uh, but to begin this as it's uh, proper, let me welcome our CEO, Maria Benjumea, CEO of South Summit. Welcome, Maria. Thank you very much, Marisol. And uh, welcome, everybody. Here we are. Here we are in uh, Madrid. Here we are in South Summit. And here we are in Spain. Looking forward to seeing all of you very soon here in Madrid in the next South Summit. And, uh, well, and here we are in this incredible place, the War Room IE University. IE University is our partner in crime since the very beginning. We started together in 2012. And here we are because for IE University is absolutely key. The, to support and to, they are absolutely convinced and how entrepreneurship and innovation is key for the development and is key for this university. So today, as Marisol has said, we start with industry, industry 4.0. So this is a very important, um, this is a very important sector and industry for everybody and for just to develop the world. So I don't want to lose one sec because we have an exciting afternoon or morning for America. So Marisol, please, let's start the game. And welcome everybody. Thank you, thank you very much, Maria. You always uh, inject us with the right kind of energy. And so, is everybody ready for today? Hope so. Let me welcome one close friend, a, a woman that I admire truly, and we will launch this day with a good conversation. Blanca Galletero, head of EMEA for Splunk. Welcome. Here we are, far but close, in this perfect mix, in a unique setting. Welcome to the South Summit family. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Marisol. What can I say? Uh, thank you to South Summit, thank you to EIE, thank you to Maria, and thank you to the audience. Without the audience, we don't have an event, so thank you to every one of you. So, uh, I really hope that everybody is keeping safe and well in the given circumstances. And what can I say? Today, I am a very, very proud Spaniard. Okay? I am here in South Summit, the biggest uh, innovation uh, event for startups in the south of Europe. So thank you so much for inviting me. And you're a perfect representation of what South Summit embodies, talking about innovation, global vision, and we will get to that today. But first of all, let's uh, get to know a little bit more about Blanca. Blanca, tell us about what you do and what's your career and, and the context, so people get to know about you a little bit more. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, before I get started with my professional career, let me share with everybody that I believe that there are certain things that have happened during my life that have made me uh, the way I am, okay? And basically, I uh, started, you know, very young. I saw myself on a train going to meet up with my parents, which were in a different country, and at the end of the trip, you know, I had a price because uh, my parents were waiting for me. So, that trigger, a uh, really, really huge curiosity, okay, into, into positive things with positive outcome. At the same time, I was brought up by my extended family, okay, so a sense of belonging was very important for me, and I was super lucky. I was always surrounded by really good friends, 
very good teachers. One of my teachers, you know, still being my mentor. And that really uh, made me appreciate to be surrounded by smart people. So having said that, you know, all those things basically made me uh, make the decision together with my husband, which is my, my life companion, to go, to go to the UK. And that's when, you know, really the fun started. I was the first person from my family to go to university. I uh, trained as a lawyer, okay? I found out I didn't like it, so I retrained <laughs> myself in IT, and we made the decision to go to the UK. And I started working for Amazon. I wow. got to know Jeff Bezos, and I got to leave the digital revolution that happened from a retail perspective. And I work at Amazon when it was still being a bookstore only. I lived through the app server revolution, and then I decided to come back to Spain because, you know, I, I, if you remember when uh, the bombs exploded in London yes. on the 7th of July 2005, I was pregnant and I was in the tube. Nothing happened to me, but it made us make a decision to come back to our home I country. Scared, yeah. We came back to uh, Spain and I decided to go and work for Oracle on the, with the enterprise data uh, uh, scenario. From there, you know, it really triggered to me the, the need to identify you know, new ways of managing data. We could see that all the structured data was already there, but I could already see that there was a new paradigm appearing. Okay. So Microsoft started Azure, and there <laughs> I went. I went to uh, Microsoft to experience this new operating model. Then uh, I could see software as a service was uh, taking off, I went to Salesforce, I was employee number five in Spain. Wow. And when I <laughs> left six years later, I was employee, there were 200 employees. So exponential growth, super, super interesting. And the cognitive revolution, artificial intelligence started to appear and I could see how we could apply this artificial intelligence, to, for example, to contact centers. And I started working for a, a startup company, which was around, focused around digital labor. I could see all the customer experience that we uh, do every single day, you know, is creating a lot of uh, footprint around us. And customer experience really kicked my interest. I decided to join Oracle to create the ecosystem for fintech and financial services industries. And finally, here I am. In the middle of the pandemic, I, I made the decision to change jobs, okay? I am at Splunk. Splunk is the data to everything, as we call it. And you know, later on I will say, you know, what do we mean by data to everything? Basically, we have seen that with the upcoming of data everywhere and the footprint that we are uh, executing in the 24 by 7 interactions we have, you know, we do need a platform to manage that. And here I am. Wow, so, and um, connecting it to the ideals of the industry, you know, we, I think we realize that there are there have been, as we can prove through your own career, this layer of exponential growth companies and, and the waves of technology. And, um, and we see the story and what we can learn from the story about adaptation, about uh, how to confront the challenges that we have nowadays. Is there anything that you learned or anything you can share about this adaptability? Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, what I can say is, Right now, we need to think about platforms that help us to manage complexity. And when I say complexity, it's different from complicated things. So let me put you an example. You know, when I'm talking about com a complicated thing, it's a car. A car has uh, thousands of parts. You follow the instructions, you put them together. It takes you years, but eventually you get it right, okay? This is a complicated thing, okay, to assemble a car. Uh, what I mean by complexity is, you know, Imagine, for example, you are a soldier. You get instructions, okay, and you go out there. And then when you go out there, there is no plan anymore. Reality kicks in and you have to dynamically and in real time make your own decisions. This is what we need to do today. We need to set up platforms that allow us in this dynamic and constantly changing environment to identify, you know, what is the story for us. And when I say the, dot, the, the story, what I mean is, there are thousands of data points around us and we just need to put them together. This is so interesting and when you, you tell about the, the concept of platform, I think we are connecting, of course, technologies, but of course also the ability to connect and interact the knowledge that we have to make smarter decisions all the way around. 
And I think just set perfectly the mood to talk about the next and the specific uh, topics related to industry. How can we apply this complexity perspective, the data to everything concept, to the industry in particular? Okay, so for example, we have seen the uptaking of uh, technologies such as cloud, IoT, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, uh, machine learning, and the convergence between IT and OT, you know, this is what is happening in industry.4, uh, 4.0, <laughs> sorry. And this is what's happening. What does that mean, you know, from an evolution? Is that an evolution or is it a revolution? And this is what we need to think about, okay? My, my uh, recommendation or my approach is to try to have an end-to-end -end view with a holistic approach that allows you to expect the unexpected because we don't know what is going to happen in two, three, six, 12 months, right? So we need to have this adaptability because why? Because we need to be able to, for example, have supply, supply chain. You know, what we are seeing is that supply chain is really uh, evolving. What do I mean by that? We are seeing with the pandemic, production centers used to be in China. Now we are seeing an, a, a, a phenomenon Relocation. of, uh, you know, uh, 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 coming back uh, production centers, you know, into closer places. Why? Because customers have higher expectations and we expect things faster and we expect things much more personalized. So the production and assembly of those products needs to be closer to us. Kilometers, kilometers zero, okay? Producers of kilometers zero now have the platforms to put those products you know, to their ecosystems. And this is why I am so interested in ecosystems. Finding a, a healthy way to keep everybody in the ecosystem creates a balance that allows people to manage complexity with a, a lot of complicated things. So I don't know, did I answer your question? Yes, of course, and you opened so other many questions. I always say that a good um, answer is a, an answer that opens to more conversation. No? And you know, I think with South Summit, we really continuously try to do this, create ecosystems, connect people who have the right kind of complementarity and move forward in, the, in, in all industries. And of course, I think that when we're talking about Industry Point O, besides the hardware and the rigid activities that we already have in place and the expertise that, by the way, in all the countries that are that we are seeing right now, there's a lot of talent for, to do that. Um, there's also the, the complement on how to analyze our data, our infrastructure, our network, the supply chain around it, the processes, the people involved. No? Um, so what would be your recommendation for these industries? What would be one advice on your side? Okay, my advice would be, you know, really make an effort and try, you know, to, to close the gap. What do I mean by that? We are, you know, we have gone from data miners to data scientists to data tellers, okay? And this is, you know, the data is out there and is waiting for us to tell a story. We, we only need to identify which data makes sense for the outcome that we are expecting. So for example, if we want to increase you know, our forecast for production, let's try to find the data points that tell us what are the customer expectations for this specific product. Perfect, so the one final question before, uh, before we close this part of the event. Um, considering all the career that you've had, all the uh, evolution and companies that you've been participating in, I imagine the Blanca maybe 20 years ago, uh, what would surprise her about the future? What would be an innovation that you will be like, oh my God, I wouldn't imagine this. Okay, okay, I love that question. <laughs> because I can relate to it because I have a daughter which is going next year to university and she takes for granted things which amaze me. Okay, like for example, you know, I charge my car in my house. So electric cars are here. We are connected all the time. I, she is connected all the time. I know where she is. My father didn't know, you know, where I was. GPS, internet, I mean, uh, for example, entertainment by the man in the car, uh, self-driving vehicles, all those things are here and it's just unbelievable. 
Blanca, thank you very much for giving this refreshing view and I would say also a holistic view because at the end industry is also an element of the ecosystem that is connected to everything, uh, part of the, of the critical path for evolution for us and of course the perspective of the data used for it is critical. Thank you very much for coming today. We feel privileged you for are, having you here. You are very, very welcome, Marisol. What I would say is, you know, everybody here, which is already in a, in a startup, hey, you know, you are all winners, right? Yes, you know, focus on the right things and enjoy the journey. Because if you do it, the music will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Blanca. <laughs> Thank you. Maria, welcome on stage. <laughs> well, I only want with you to thank everybody, here we are, no? because uh, well, this is our summit, to be all together to connect the startups, the investors, and the corporates looking for the innovation of the startups, and just to connect all together. And first of all, of all before you start with the competition, I think it's a, a huge thank you to everyone that is here in our incredible jury. It's a, great investors, the best startups you are going to listen and to watch to, and our absolutely great partners uh, around everywhere. So thank you to everyone, and now you can start with the competition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And you know, I think uh, it's part of South Summit's story, this uh, startup competition, but I also enjoy a lot the evolution that we've made through the competition and the, the meaning and the complexity of it as well. You know, today we will have our startups pitching. We have this amazing jury, I will introduce them right now. They will be evaluating uh, dynamically and we will know the winner at the end of the session. And you know what, the winner will be part of a fast track to the 100 finalists in our main event, uh, our main encounter in October. So this is an interesting path also to show their value and their proposition towards uh, the, the main activity of the year. So this is a really interesting and exciting day for us. Um, as I said, we had a really powerful and interesting jury and this is one of the critical elements for us because we have a perfect representation of corporations and investors and relevant people from the industry. And this what is what makes the really difference for the startup competition, you know? This is the quality and how we are building this future. So let me mention all the, the jury members. We have Anika Jars from Startup Estonia, Corinne Jimenez from Mutua Madrileña, Henry Cashin from FinBC, Javier Benavides from BBCS Capital, Javier Ulesia from Bullnet Capital, Owen Reynolds from Expon Capital, Ricardo Vitini from Ferrovial, and you just like, wow, this is a high quality jury. I'm getting excited. Okay. Uh, Sin Seton Rogers from Profounders Capital, Álvaro Borcari from Cuatecasas, Álvaro Sagrario from SACIR, Ana López Amat from Orange, Antonio Velázquez from IKEA, Asier Rufino from Tecnalia, Carlos Silva from Faber, Cristian Uli Molina from Logifruit, Daniel Manzano from Vodafone, Gonzalo Tradacete from Faraday Venture Partners, Victoria Alemán from Globant Ventures, Ivonne Iribar from Semex Ventures, Iván Feito from Prosegur, Javier Martínez de Irujo from Axon Partner Group, John Retalosa from Accenture, Jorge Barón from Adara Ventures, Luis Felipe Chiorique from Elewit, Red Eléctrica, Martín Beitia from Iberia, Miguel Almagro from Oracle, Mónica Cernuda from IBM, Sharanaya Eswaran from Project A, Víctor Monsalvo García from Aqualia, and Yacine Diori from Huawei App Gallery. Gallery. So, welcome, thank you everybody. This is a, a marvelous display of companies, countries, uh, backgrounds, experience. And with this, we will have an overview and a val uh, evaluation of the startups, not valuation, but ranking of the startups that are participating today. So, 
We are going to begin with the pitches, and after each pitch, the startups will be asked a question by the jury, okay? And without further ado, let's begin and kick off the startup competition. Our first startup for the day is Ellipsa. We will hear the pitch from Jeff Kimmel, who is the CEO. They are from the United States, and it's a no-code analytics platform designed to empower industrial IoT users to apply machine learning without the need for a data scientist. They automate the creation and deployment of AI models and integrate the insights directly into leading IoT data management tools, helping to make applications smarter. Welcome and let's hear the pitch. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Kimmel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ellipsa. Ellipse is a no-code analytics platform designed to empower IoT users to apply machine learning without the need for a data scientist. IoT devices are generating a wave of new information, with the expectation being that 75 billion connected devices will be generating 79 data bytes of data by 2025. However, these connected devices are still producing disconnected insights. Data has matured to the point where users want to extract new insights with AI. However, the industries where IoT is most prevalent tend to be underserved in terms of data scientists and machine learning experts. In a survey, 68% of organizations listed a shortage of AI talent as the leading challenge to scale and usage. Even those that do have the resources take an average of 90 days to bring a single model to production due to complexities of existing systems. Our solution is what we call approachable AI, driven by three core values to help turn existing insights, or sorry, existing talent into AI talent. First is usable AI. We make machine learning easy to use with clicks, not code. You can create machine learning models customized to your data with as little as three steps. Second is explainable AI. We instantly validate model results without the technical jargon. You can determine the success of an AI model in terms that data users can understand. And third is accessible AI. We save and deploy models in seconds with a push of a button. Our API-driven approach enables organizations to plug the insights back into their existing workflows and applications. The AI for IoT market is growing rapidly, expecting to reach 65.9 billion by 2025. Our strategy in capturing this market has been through partnerships with IoT platforms. IoT platforms' core focus is on connecting and visualizing data. Our core focus is on analyzing this data to extract new insights. Together, we create an end-to-end -end solution with the IoT user in mind. We face competition primarily from large auto ML solutions. However, these solutions are designed to make data scientists more efficient. Our core differentiator from competitors is our approach and our target user. Unlike competitors, our focus is not on the data scientists, but on creating software that broadens the universe of who can apply data science techniques. Our management team consists of me and my co-founder. Together, we have over 35 years experience working in data and automation. We serve in a variety of different business roles that gives us the unique insight to take this problem through the lens of the data user. At Ellipsa, we're driven to make AI more approachable, to expand the universe of AI talent in order to scale analytics across IoT. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. So let's uh, kick off the round of questions. Anyone wants to ask the quest uh, a question, remember, to click the raise your hand button in your screen and we will give you the turn to speak. Who wants to ask a question? Yasin, welcome. Ask your question. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, um, since, this, um, since the platform is, is not using code, how flexible is the, the solution for, for, uh, for customizing the, the, the machine learning models? Yeah, so with, without code, we basically start by asking the question of what are you, what type of model are you looking to build? Outlier detection. Uh, I sorry, I, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Or? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, I can tell the answer if you want, Jeff. Can you guys hear me okay there or no? I can hear you, Jeff, if you want to speak your answer, and I will translate it. Uh, just repeat it. Sure, I was saying, so the first thing we start with is asking the type of model that the user is looking to, to predict, whether it's an outlier, a value, or an event. And then we go through a series of steps 
that is customizable to allow them to go down the path of creating their own their own model that is unique to their data. Okay, let's hope that I can t I repeat this well. So they begin by asking the right kind of a structure so they can develop the right steps to to create the final analysis. Um, do we have any other question? No? Oh, okay, Ricardo Vitini. Go ahead. Can you unmute, please? Ricardo, maybe we are not hearing you. You need to unmute your mic. No, we can go with Ivan Feito, maybe. Ivan. Oh, okay, as always, but I, I was able to hear Ricardo, but maybe not loud enough. But, but I was able to hear him. Okay, anyway. perfect. Ask your question. Ask away. Uh, well, my, my question is, you have mentioned that, uh, well, you interact very easily with any IoT, but I mean, do you, do you have any specific focus on some kind of IoT sensors or, or you are open almost to anything? Because my experience is that at the end, IoT is so broad that there are so many different uh, systems and so on that sometimes it's difficult not to, to have something that covers the, the whole IoT spectrum. Yeah, so on that, the in terms of what the system is capable of pulling in, it can pull in any type of data. And, and the reason, this is actually the reason we partner with IoT platforms, because they actually connect and normalize the data. And then when we pull it in, it's effectively an Excel sheet, it's tabular data. So so we, fo we partner with people who, who have the core competency of, of doing the communication of the different types of sensors, like you said, so on, on that, we are able to, to really work with any type of sensor data that is connected to our partners. We do lead though with use cases um, that are pretty prevalent, such as predictive maintenance um, and things like that. So we, when we are talking to customers, we, um, we do lead with specific use cases that, that we have kind of proven, but we also have the ability to work with them to, to figure out a, a variety of different use cases across industries. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is a perfect way to kick off the startup competition. Let's get now ready for the second pitch. It will be from Flow, Flow Litty. Um, the pitcher is Jean Clavel, partner manager. They are from France. Um, Flow, Flow Litty is a software as a service platform that provides real-time inventory optimization and replenishment using machine learning and optimization. As an intelligent trusted third, they connect companies in a network to optimize their inventories, to limit cost and avoid shortage without the need to directly share sensitive data. Flowlity, it's your turn. Hi there, my name is Jean and um, I'm happy to present you fully today. Um, thanks a lot for giving us the opportunity to, to present what we are doing. So the, the challenges we're trying to overcome, uh, the, the problem in a way we have been observing and uh, with Flowlity was born from this observation, poor inventory management accounts for billions of losses, overstocks and product shortages. And um, on the other end, 85% of companies struggled with inefficient in digital technologies in their supply chain. And Flowlity was born from this observation. Generally speaking, two blind spots remain um, like and create uncertainty. Firstly, supply chain are increasingly more and more complex and uh, in an ever-changing environment, uh, it's more and more difficult to have the right level of stuff at the right place. And the other point is about the lack of collaboration between the different elements of the chain. So the need of agility and better measurement of entertainty to optimize inventories is the point we want to solve. Flowlity is a plug and play end to end SaaS solution um, that you plug above your ERP. We built a solution that helps your teams to make better decisions and prevent issues to optimize your supply chain. 
the tools requires no configuration from users. It directly provides forecast visualization and directly actionable recommendation. We do commit to one forecast we suggest at the lower level of your chain. And this probabilistic approach we do have given this um, forecast helps us to make you have the better decision regarding your replenishments. Our flow-based approach allows you to adjust dynamically your inventories on your network. The uniqueness of what we are doing at the moment and the very singularity of Lolity is based on the construction of a real network. We act as a trusted third party between the different stakeholders on the supply chain and killing the, thus the famous ball whip effect. Flowlity is the right mix of supply chain expertise, AI and software experience. Combining these fields, we want to deliver the better to the best to our customers and they are at the moment creating incredible value. We do compare ourselves to the different methods, inventory ratio, and you can have here a few customers and the, the, the figures they are observing with us. Within the last two years, we've been deploying all over Europe uh, in different um, uh, combination, uh, helping to optimize finished product packaging, multi echelon optimization, and in automotive, metal, jewelry. Here are a few logos of companies working with us. And that's why we've been selected by Google and McKinsey among the top 50 most promising startup in Europe. And we are currently raising a new round Serie A to accelerate the growth. Thanks a lot for listening to me today and happy to hear your questions. Wow, thank you very much. I enjoyed very much your presentation, but let's hear what the jury has to ask about that. Do you, does anyone wants to ask any questions? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Um, Ricardo, go ahead, ask your question. Let's hope we are lucky now. Can you hear me? No? Ricardo, are you there? No? We can't connect. Well, don't worry, because we can help you to solve the issue. And, and you can, uh, uh, they will talk to you right now in the chat, and we will come back to you later on. Anyone else who wants to ask a question? Sharanaya, go ahead. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for the pitch. It was um, super interesting. Um, I had a question. Your customer base looks quite broad. So how long does it take for you to integrate for the first time with a customer? We can't hear you. I don't know if you're muted, Jan. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm muted. I'm yeah. back. Do you hear me now? <laughs> Okay, uh, so at the beginning, it was quite difficult to understand uh, how we needed to get the data from and where we had to push it back. But uh, we had uh, an acceleration program with SAP, with the cohort, SAP IO and procurement and supply chain. And we built some interfaces to have some APIs with uh, the ERPs and us or 70% of our customers are working with SAP. We have this integration, so it gets more and more quickly uh, on this. It depends on time, but it can go from one month to three months. It depends. Perfect. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alvaro Volkai, um, now you can go ahead, unmute yourself, and ask your question. Fire away. Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations, Jean Baptiste. Um, I have a question regarding how do you access data? You know, part of the business model is getting the right information from the right people and putting that together to have, you know, through your AI, provide a, a solution or an answer to a business, to, to uh, I would say, sector need. Um, in my experience uh, as a lawyer, I might say, uh, this, is, this is complicated from two perspectives. One is getting, uh, you know, sufficient trust from uh, the players in the market that you will treat the data I, you know, with some degree of confidentiality, that will make them feel comfortable with it. And the second is uh, to get proprietary rights or enough proprietary rights on the data to be able to process them on your own as your own data. How do you face those problems? So, uh, do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, to answer the second, I, I'm not super clear about the second part of the question. To ask the first part, I do believe that uh, at the beginning, uh, some of our customers like Saint Gobain, etc., were fearing about that. But as we do deliver these results and we build some on the last technology regarding cyber security, and we've been through all the like tests to have the cyber security, um, like tests they have in big cops, and uh, we've been through, and now we, we it's getting easy and easy. And as I, I do believe the value we do deliver, people are trusting us and uh, it's not a big issue about the confidentiality and the, the, the trust is here. Um, and the second part, I'm not really sure to have a good understanding of what you mean. Yeah, sure. Uh, because you're you know, leveraging on data that uh, the sector is providing to you. Uh, sometimes people in the sector believe that their own data is valuable and it's their own. So they provide the data, but as long as you only use them for mm -hmm. their own purposes, uh, mm -hmm. part of their part of your value is, com is combining all the information that you get to provide a, a better value, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and do, you, do you face problems with that? Are your contracts built around getting property rights on the, on the data? No, I, I, as for now, and I, I hope I'm, I'm touching wood at the moment, and I hope it will still like that. But uh, now people are, are like understanding the value. Like uh, the first, the, 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 the data state, it's their own property, and we only use it to make it better. And they do understand the fact that we have only one model learning on all of their data, but the property of their data remains their, their data, and there is not this issue at the moment and I, I don't believe it will be uh, a fact. I, I, I fingers crossed. I, I hope it's clear. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank happy you. to jump on another question, uh, Alvaro, if you want to pursue the discussion. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much and good luck with the session. Okay, let's go to the next startup and it's called Hand Plus Robotics. We will be hearing the pitch from Albert Couso. He is the co-founder. They are from Singapore. And they, they make picking of difficult items in challenging environment easy for industrial robots. Their app software platform enables the deployment of customized solution quickly and painlessly. So let's hear about them. The floor is all yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, judges, organizers, and guests. My name is Arvid Koso, and I'm the CEO and a co-founder of Handplus Robotics. Companies across many industries, especially logistics and manufacturing, need to scale up their material handling operations such as speaking and improve productivity through robotics and automation. The drive is fueled by the global economic activity, most importantly e-commerce. Its growth is expected to be two to three times annually and is projected to reach almost four trillion US dollars in 2020. Unfortunately, automation is not as simple as buying robots and components such as grippers and cameras. When surveyed, uh, when we surveyed our target clients, they told us that it is difficult to automate because they do not know how to do it. They are afraid that if they buy a robotic solution, it will not work according to the technical requirement and will not satisfy their business case. In short, there's a high chance of the automation becoming a failed project. But what is the real reason why it is difficult to adapt robotics and automation for a factory or warehouse? Well, every picking problem is unique. It is likely that two companies handling similar types of product will implement different robotic solutions. Why? Because every picking situation has two main sub-problems, the technical and the business. Technically, picking is challenging because of three Ps. The place, such as the warehouse or the factory environment, is not designed for robots. The product itself may be difficult to see or pick by a robot. And lastly, the picking process may require human dexterity. On the business side, there are also three C's that our clients always consider. That their picking problem is complex and not as simple as they thought it was. That there are many technologies available in the market and they do not know how to choose the right one. And lastly, they worry about cost and that the money that they would, that they would spend would not satisfy the business case. Handplus developed a software platform called APP Plus for AI powered picking and more that encapsulates our ex expertise, experience, and learnings on pick and place using robots. APP has four major modules, the system manager, the robotics module, vision module, and the gripper module. Most of the modules has AI uh, to handle some specific tasks. Example, vision uses AI for processing and image and identifying what the items that needs to be picked. 
Now, with APP Plus, Hand Plus is able to provide three types of picking cells. Pick Plus is a fast picker that is that is uh, can handle multiple items from a bin or from a shelf. Move Plus is a fast picker that is mounted on AGV, which can go around the warehouse or factory. And Pack Plus is a pick plus cell that is further integrated with other automations, such as labeling or packing machine, to provide complete picking and packing solutions. Our picking solutions can use any robot hardware, such as arms from UR, ABB, TM, Miskawa, Mitsubishi, and other brands. APP Plus also allows for fast development and a limited variations and expansion of the picking solutions. That is Hand Plus in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this was a, also an exciting startup. So let's hear from the jury. Who wants to ask any question? Click the hand in your, in your computer. OK, we're waiting for questions from the jury. And Ricardo, if you still have troubles, you can write your question, and I will read it aloud. So who wants to ask any question for our friends from Singapore? OK, Luis Chiroque, go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Albert, for your for your pitch. I would like to know if you have any trouble, or have you been have you ha found any trouble in any task that a client a client uh, ask you uh, that you cannot solve currently with your robots? Uh, there are some. For example, um, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes, I can yeah. hear you. For example, we have a client uh, who is doing uh, material recovery, recycling, and they want us to do to handle recycling. So I thought it was recycling cans and bottles and this kind of thing. But they were recycling wood and chunks of concrete that's, that normally comes from a uh, building that has been uh, demolished. So they kind of like uh, the expectation of the client was too high. I think they were thinking that the robot can do anything or can pick anything. So <clears throat> we encounter this from time to time. Uh, but uh, the tendency is there is always a solution. Uh, there won't be a solution if the client kind of sticks to a very narrow definition of how he wants the picking to happen. So, but otherwise, normally there's a way to, there's a way to build a robot system that can do it. Perfect. Thank you very much. And today I read about uh, the first robot painting by hand with artificial intelligence, a work of art. So yeah, work, lots of works with hands. Any other question from the jury? Antonio, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good pitch. Thank you, Albert. So the question would be um, different uh, customers, different retailers uh, have different products, different mm. boxes and packages. So, yeah. how translatable is the learnings of the picking of the robot from one retailer to the other? Or in uh, other words, how long would it take you to train for the specific products or packages of a retailer? Uh, okay. Um, as, I mentioned in, in, as I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, every picking problem is kind of unique to a particular client. That said, Using our APP Plus uh, toolbox, the software platform, uh, we can do like some kind of 80-20 because we, we reuse hardware. The hardware is actually off the shelf. So if, even if we have to build a new hardware, normally this is just the gripper, uh, which is a small kind of, of, of customization to do. So the 20% is mostly on, as you already guessed, mostly on the AI, retrain, etc. But based on our experience, we can deploy a new system within two to four weeks. Assuming all of the hardware have come, have been procured, and they're all here, the robot, the, the grippers, the cameras, it takes us as short as two to four weeks. Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, we have any other questions for them. No? We can then thank you all the way to Singapore. Greetings. And let's continue with the next startup. Um, we are going to listen Juan Bautista Tomás Gavarrón. He is the CEO of Quartec. They're from Spain. And they are experts in IoT, blockchain, and hardware sensing technologies, particularly as regards the design, development, and commercialization of air quality sensor devices to the industry. Welcome, the floor is all yours. Hey guys, welcome to this presentation. My name is Juan, CEO of Cartec Innovations. 
And let's begin. So currently, air quality monitors for the industry tend to be extremely expensive. In fact, they require potential clients to assume costly upfront payments. And we add to this, they're recurring reactive maintenance because these devices are continuously exposed to the environment. But in CarTech Innovations, we have a solution and we are talking about PIMAS. Now you might, might be wondering what is PIMAS? It could be maybe power management as a service, well, or perhaps project management as a service. Nah. Or maybe prime minister as a service. Too good to be true. No, actually, we are talking about preventive maintenance as a service, because thanks to our proprietary technology, a powered algorithms, we enable our devices to be fully operational all the time, no more downtime for our uh, clients. In fact, we offer extremely competitive upfront costs because thanks to our SaaS model applied to this preventive maintenance service, we have higher uh, customer loyalty and then we generate more business. So the market is actually compounded by several different things. In fact, we start by having an air quality system monitoring market estimated at $6 billion by the end of 2025. Now, if we focus on the heavy industry, thanks to our, this source, we assume that we have 600 million and when and then estimating a, an, a penetration of 20%, we would reach 120 million by the end of 2030. With the competition now consisting of these major legacy players providing devices that are unscalable and very costly, but we have seen recent uh, new show ups like these small players that offer more scalability and lower prices but no preventive maintenance like us. What are the goals for 2021? Well, we want to reach a, turn, a turnover goal of 200 k by the end of this year, already invoiced 40 k thanks to clients like the ones showing here. And attention investors, we offer 300 k investment. OK, we are offering these at 10 tickets, 30,000 each. The team is composed by Juan, six years as entrepreneur, Antonio, he's the CEO of the company. Also Rafael, an expert in software development, Isabel, expert in environmental chemistry, and ending with Joan, who raised already $2 million so far. Do you want to know more? Just feel free to contact me and I will gladly invite you to a cup of coffee. Thank you, bye-bye. In the hope for that cup of coffee, coffee, and in the meantime, questions from the jury. So, anyone wants to ask a question? Ivan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for very interesting presentation. Quick question there. Uh, I was wondering if during the past year, because of the pandemics and COVID-19, have you had any particular application for that, or has any of your customers use? your machines to, to measure the air quality? Because I have read some that people, uh, well, like the number of particles in the air and so on could be an indicator of how uh, how probable uh, it is to to, uh, to 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 get COVID because of air. No? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Ivan, for your question. Very interesting question, in fact. So uh, the thing is that uh, we were born in August uh, 2020, so we're just uh, eight, uh, eight months old. Um, and the main reason was because we started with a very big um, major client. And in fact, uh, related to, for example, uh, somehow detecting uh, COVID in, the, in some inner spaces, Yes, we have uh, been asked for uh, providing this service, and in fact, we have the technology to provide it. Um, and in fact, also we have the uh, opportunity to also uh, somehow uh, give our clients the option to know if they are exposing uh, themselves to a very high risk of infection. So even if for the moment we are focusing on the heavy industry, our technology is fully ready for that. Thank you very much, Juan. And now let's uh, leave the room to, for Victor Monsalvo to ask his question. 
Victor, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Very interesting pitch. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to, 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 if you could please elaborate a little, a little bit about the, how do you foresee the integration of your system in the existing monitoring tools in interfaces that we have in our factories and the decision support system? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a very good question, Victor. Uh, the thing is that we normally collect telemetry uh, data from sensors. In fact, uh, we somehow isolate telemetry from the real measurements. And what we do is uh, basically carry out anomaly, anomaly detection, um, basically algorithms in order to identify or better said, anticipate when uh, some kind of uh, malfunction can uh, occur. So when we're talking about interfacing, we are also uh, very much experienced in this regard, because for instance, we needed to integrate with one of our clients with a very legacy system, mostly based about Profibus or even, for example, OPC, it's a technical uh, jargon, okay? And then we adapted our interfaces to all of their uh, basically uh, machines. So uh, what, uh, it's just a matter of knowing what they have, we will provide a solution. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as you can see, we are in the perfect uh, strike right now. And we are ready for the next startup, Risk Ledger. We will listen Ashley Mitchell. He's head of growth and marketing. He is uh, connecting from the UK. And Risk Ledger gives organizations all the tools they need to run a comprehensive cybersecurity-led third-party risk management, or TPRM for friends. Um, they program against their entire supply chain at speed and at scale while making it simple, free and fast for third parties to engage with the process and improve their risk management maturity. We are ready for you. Hi everyone. Risk Ledger was started because one of our founders could see that traditional security risk management methods for the supply chain weren't up to the job of reducing cybersecurity attacks caused by compromised third parties. Over 60% of organizations have experienced a supply chain cyber attack. It's such a big problem that all recent data protection and cyber resilience regulations have included specific obligations for organizations to actively manage supply chain security risks, particularly for critical national infrastructure organizations. Supply chains are getting larger and more complex, so it's a growing problem, especially for large enterprises who can have thousands of suppliers. Traditional methods for managing supply chain security risks suffer from two key drawbacks. Firstly, they're slow and costly for all parties involved, so they're not scalable beyond a small percentage of the supply chain, or easy to implement for many organizations beyond those with large security budgets. Secondly, they're not effective at reducing the risk or number of supply chain cybersecurity breaches over time, acting as more of a paper shield. The Risk Ledger platform enables organizations of all sizes to run a comprehensive security-led third-party risk management program across their entire supply chain, while cutting the time and cost per supplier by up to 80% compared to traditional programs. We redefine the process by moving away from point-in-time traditional assessments to a continuous monitoring model, allowing organizations to quickly identify, measure, and mitigate risks by gaining continuous visibility of risk controls implemented by their third parties, as well as fourth, fifth, and sixth parties. Our platform operates like a network, providing the data pipe for clients and suppliers to share risk data. Clients can connect with all their suppliers in one place, while suppliers are able to share a single risk control profile with multiple clients to reduce their burden of work in a do once, use many model. This risk control profile aligns with the ISO standard on supply chain management and the NIST framework, and it was developed with the support of the UK's National Cyber Security Centre. The platform continuously monitors the status of each supplier's risk control over time, eliminating the need for their clients to repeat the review process annually and compounding the time saved year on year. Every time a supplier connects with a new client, their risk control profile is reviewed again, creating a continuous commercial incentive for suppliers to maintain 
and improve their risk management regime over time. As the platform matures, clients will be able to actively detect and protect themselves from live supply chain threats. We deliver value for information security, compliance and procurement teams within an organization and make it easier for them to collaborate with each other on their third party risk management program. That's why we're already trusted by major clients like those you can see on the screen and more than 700 suppliers on our platform include these big names. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I look forward to answering them now. Thank you, thank you very much. And you know, uh, for me, it's a special music to my ears. It's especially interesting to know tools that help to connect processes as complex and, and uh, complicated as those from procurement and risk management. And so let's hear from our jury. Who wants to ask a question? Raise your little hand on their computer. We have jury all the way from Peru, UK, Singapore, Portugal. Spain, Argentina, let's make this uh, universal collaboration and questions. Who wants to ask a question? Okay, Antonio, Antonio Velasco, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Good pitch, thank you. And, and uh, intriguing um, concept. The question here would be, um, how hard is the integration um the integration with the provider and the uh, the company itself the what do you integrate with with um of the shelf procurement solutions um what do you integrate with and how difficult is the is the integration hi antonio thanks so much um for 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 your question so so for, to, to 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 start with if you are a corporate that wanted to start running a third party risk management program with risk ledger, risk ledger um, today, we could have you up and running um, today. And you just needed a, a list of your suppliers and email contacts for your supplier. So, so there's no need to integrate if you don't want to. Going forward, I think the question, what, what you're trying to get at is how risk ledger would fit in with the wider procurement um, uh, uh, um, uh, tech stack that people use to manage their vendors. And what we, we, we plan to do is build those integrations as our customers require it. And we do hear from time to time that customers want to be able to automatically put their suppliers through the risk ledger program and trigger that using their existing procurement programs. But we plan to build that as our customers de um, uh, demand it going forward. Thank you very much. Javier Benavides, you were raising your hands. Do you still have a question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, you, you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Ashley, for your, for your presentation. It was very, very nice. Uh, let, let, please let, help me understand uh, who, who is your customer? Who, who are you looking for uh, as, as an industry to, to, to sell your product? And uh, if it's uh, suitable, for example, for quality assurance, uh, for startups. Thanks so much for your, your question, Javier. So um, what's really um, Im important is that the uh, supply chain security risk management challenge is, is industry and geography agnostic. However, there are some industries that particularly need um, and this, and this tends to be critical national infrastructure organizations because they um, obviously are critical, um, but also have some of the, the most complex and, and biggest supply chains. Then we look at industries like telecoms and uh, finance, where they, 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 this, this is a more mature program within those industries. And then within the organization, as I mentioned on the pitch, it's actually, we, we deliver value for those three key teams. So for information security officers, they are really keen to get that visibility across the supply chain and the risk controls that are implemented across the um, supply chain. For procurement, when they are uh, procuring and onboarding new, new vendors, they want to make sure obviously that those vendors meet a certain level of, of, of cybersecurity uh, 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 risk controls, but also procurement risk controls and finance risk controls. And then from compliance, I mentioned there about the regulations that, um, that actually mandate organizations run this process, whether it be about data protection 
or cybersecurity in the supply chain. So there's, there's three teams within the organization, but when it comes to industries, it's actually um, industry agnostic. And if you saw on the, the client page that we had there, we've got water companies, finance companies, telecoms, retail, um, and, and it's something that's coming up for all industries at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier, for your question. Uh, does anyone wants to ask a question? Anyone else? We are uh, in the last part uh, of the session, so let's open, give the opportunity for anyone else. Miguel Almagro, welcome. Hello again, how are you? Ask your question. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thanks to everyone. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, it's quite exciting, your, your project, your, your startup and what you're doing. And uh, the, the quick question is, what is your biggest challenge in the next coming six months? Because I'm trying to figure out the, the momentum that you are living right now. So the question is, what so, is your Michael, biggest thank you. thank you so much for uh, uh, your, your question. Um, and look, we've, everybody's been through a, a really difficult economic time in the, in the past year. And so we're, we actually feel really fortunate that our biggest challenge at the moment is getting our product in front of as many enterprise buyers as possible. Once we get in front of um, buyers, we tend to find that there is some really strong interest and it's, it's actually quite unusual that we don't move on to a trial phase. So our biggest challenge, particularly me and the marketing and, and, and growth team, um, is making sure that every organization that is looking at um, upgrading their third party risk management program knows about risk ledger understands the value that we provide over the um, competition that's out there and has the opportunity to to to, to at least trial us thank you thank, thank you very much ashley thank you miguel for your question and this is the end of our startup competition you know right now the jury will be voting we will be calculating the winners that will happen here in a second dimension and in the meantime, we are opening the floor for an interesting conversation. Let me welcome Vinod Jayakumar and Anand Sambasivan, who will be talking uh, in, for the next session. So welcome, are you there? Yeah, we are. Hi, great to be here and, and, and thanks for having us on, on today. Uh, I'll just do a very quick introduction to myself and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Anand to do, do the introduction to himself. I'm, I'm a partner at Draper Esprit. Uh, we're a slightly later stage technology and venture capital fund. Uh, we took the slightly unusual step of listing ourselves about five years ago. And as a result of that, we're investing off the back of a balance sheet. And at the same time, we also democratized access to this investing class for the everyday retail investor. And you know that's kind of pertinent to sort of why we're talking to Anand today at, at Primary Bit. So I'm going to just hand over to Anand to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Vinod. I'm Anand. I'm the CEO co-founder of a company called Primary Bid. Um, if you don't know what we do, uh, we think very hard and we're obsessing about individual participation in capital markets. And we think why we ask a lot why institutions get outsized returns and individuals don't have access to IPOs and follow ons. It is called an initial public offering after all, and, and the public are not involved in the offering. So, uh, we use technology to solve uh, a lot of these problems. Um, we're really pleased to have uh, completed our Series B round, uh, which Draper led, um, and we had so many synergies from what they do and what we do. We thought it just it was a very nice fit. Let me let me kick this off with uh, uh, with, a, with a question around sort of sort of the lie of the land in, in the retail investing world. Um, what, what is happening? Could you give us a, a sense of sort of why there is a sort of this underwater sea of movement. Some of the things that have triggered some of our thoughts are things like Airbnb doing the super host offering, and also now a deal that you're involved with, with, with Deliveroo, where it's empowering its retail base. Yeah. Look, imagine, imagine a world where, um, you know, all your favorite department stores have everything on sale, the clothes and perfumes, everything goes on sale from a few percent down to, to 90%. The only catch is you have to be worth a billion uh, euros or more to participate. Everyone else, ordinary mortals like me, we have to wait in line, wait our turn, buy uh, probably from some one of those billionaires that bought it at a 90% discount and, and say thank you afterwards. And if that was the case, if that really existed, you would see riots on the streets. People wouldn't accept it. And this kind of explains the riots we saw in the capital markets happening recently. There's this unfair access um, 
uh, advantage that the institutions have over the individuals in the capital markets. That's how they work. IPOs and follow-ons get done at discounted prices, and it only goes to the wholesale buyers. It doesn't go to the individuals. Um, but the reason for that is not anything sinister. The reason for that is that the banks have been extremely innovative around the institutional book. They're wholesalers. They serve, serve the institution clients. So when they, when they create a book, you have a lot of transparency around who's in that book and what kind of investor they are and so on. But the retail bit is stuck in the stone age, right? You just get a number. You don't know who's behind it. You don't know uh, what they're going to do with the shares, how they're connected to the company. So if we're able to collect that structured data in real time, in scale, in a compelling way, and hand it back to the company, then it becomes really meaningful. It's not scary to allocate to that demand. So to answer your question, you know, Deliveroo came to us and they said, well, we'd love to find a way to get our community involved and our customers involved. So we did the very first uh, fully integrated in-app IPO. So if you're in the UK, you open up your Deliveroo account, uh, you'll be able to look and, and, and participate in their IPO. It's never been done before. And guess what? Anybody participating is guaranteed to be a customer of Deliveroo. So they're very comfortable allocating that demand. And that's the power of technology in the capital markets and, and what we can do in scale. I mean, if you think about in, in this moment in history, where we are today right now, my question to you is, is why now? Why has it not happened historically, right? And before, before I hand it over to you, I'll give you an example of some of the things that we're actually seeing in the private markets. We're seeing an increased empowerment of ex-entrepreneurs who have now built wealth for themselves, who are able to run fundraising rounds completely by themselves. So for example, there's a company in, in, in Netherlands called Molly Payments that raised a $25 million Series A from 25 individuals. You know, you no longer need VCs like me or institutional funds anymore. And we're seeing the same sort of happen in China. So help me understand why now, why this moment in history? Okay, so I'll talk it from a public equity perspective. You're, you're, you're probably better to talk about that from a private side, right? Like, so I'll tell you, when I started my career in banking, um, over 20 years ago, and I look at the IPO process then to now, it's remarkably similar. And if I think about the IPO process pre-internet to now, it's still pretty remarkably similar. And you know, it's, it's not hard to imagine that when the IPO was originally invented all the way back then, and you know, they, they were trying to get companies to raise capital, individual and, and fragmented participation was just not in the mix. I mean, it's, these are time sensitive transactions. They're very fragmented. And there's a lot of administrative burden that goes on with taking on these orders. There is no you know, process automation that went on to allow it to happen. So they, they were excluded because that's just the only, the, there was no channel to let them in. Now, technology adapted, but this bit did not because it's a regulated space, it worked, it was pretty simple and it just continued on. Now, if you fast forward to today and you imagine that IPOs never existed and it was being created for the very first time today, in what world do you think that it wouldn't be, uh, you know, digital forward? It wouldn't be, uh, you know, API centric. It wouldn't be completely democratized and, and universal access. It just wouldn't look like it anymore. So all I'm saying is that the old process needed an upgrade and update and, 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 our technology is really enabling that to happen. And it's the key point I wanna make here is that it's not anything sinister. There's this huge narrative that's going around, which is the big institutional investors and the banks are stepping on the little guy. They don't want them to succeed. It's really not that. It's a system that's you know, uh, stymied by, by regulation. It finds, it finds it hard to move forward and it's, it has to do so through sort of violent leaps of innovation. Um, and, and we're in that period right now. And just thinking through a little bit about this, the, the, the retail investor base that we're approaching, um, how do you think about them going forward long term, sort of, you know, this idea of community based offers and empowering them with shares in a certain company? What does that actually mean to be a retail investor? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating question. I was looking at an ad that Robin Hood put out uh, that someone showed me. Uh, it said, look, you're um, you, you don't become a retail investor, you're born one. And I, and I think what they're saying with that is the markets are public. They're public markets. Anybody, if you're of age, you can go and buy a share and you suddenly become a retail investor. It doesn't, you know, it just, it, so, so everyone has access to those markets. So the bigger question is, you know, how are you going to get connected to those markets? Why do you buy a share, you know? And, and let's go back to the delivery example because we're on it. People are, a lot of people are buying those 
shares because they're connected to the company. They, they're a stakeholder, a customer and delivery. They're part of that community. And it's that community engagement that's becoming really powerful for, for single stock issuers. And no matter who you are, it's um, as you raise capital, it's the only time a, a listed company, a public company ever offers its stock out. If you think about it, it sits there passively and we can buy the shares. But the moment that they, there's only the moment that they actually try and offer it out to investors is during a capital raise. And that's the moment in time they can connect really truly and deeply with their, with their community. And that's what we're seeing that community engagement. And it's not just customers, right? It's employees, it's shareholders, it's friends and family, the general public. It's whoever the company deems as their community we will we have delightful products that allow it to utilize the capital markets framework to enfranchise them and bring them into their into their story and their ownership i've got to pick on one of the topics you touched on a bit earlier which is around employees and empowering employees um, we are seeing more and more technology companies that obviously offer in the private markets esop schemes to to these members of staff that join them and as they they travel and some of these become big and they become sort of nicely nasdaq listed they're also trying to figure out mechanics for how they can continue to do this as they travel, because these very same people who work for you are incentivized to want to invest in what they do for work. How do you see that product, if there is a product in that market, evolving? It's a phenomenal question. And it goes back to the kind of the top of this call. We talked about, you know, and it, imagine an institutional book that a bank builds, right? And the advice it gives to the company. And they'll say, hey, here's, you know, Fund ABC. They're, they're long going Lee. Um, they're a mutual fund, um, they're very sticky, they're supportive, they won't sell, they'll in fact accumulate over time, they're very high quality demand, and then they'll go up and say, oh, if this one is a, you know, it's a trading firm, you, you know, they'll add liquidity, but they'll add volatility to the share price, you may not want them, they may pay a higher price, but they'll, they'll add some volatility, and it allows the, the, the company to curate the cap table, and they give that advice. And we're trying to do the same thing on the individual side. And if you think about it, and you correlate, who is the equivalent of your long only sticky accumulating investor in the, in the institutional side, that's your mutual fund. But in the, in the individual side, that's your employee. That is the highest quality of, of investor that you want. And, and they're also part of the growth of the company and they get to share in the success of the company. Um, and so, you know, building products to allow that to happen is amazing. And we've done that, right? So, um, it's already a very much a thing in the UK. Think about accelerated offerings. We did one uh, recently for Aston Martin, a company you all know, but other companies too, you know, FTSE 100 companies like Croda, Taylor Rempe, and so on, who they, they also tapped on. So they did a shareholder bit through us. They did a general public bit through us, and they did an employee bit. If you think about it, they're doing an employee offering on an accelerated um, uh, overnight deal. It's unheard of. And it, you, you need, you know, process automation and tech to make that happen. So, um, it's a it's a really important stakeholder group for North and, and I think companies are really trying to take them on seriously. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, thinking about sort of this exact same empowerment of the retail investor, as it were, in other parts of the world, what examples have you seen, whether that's in China or in Australia or even in Singapore? Could you paint an image of some of the things that you're seeing that, that could end up being another sea of change? Well, it's, it's happening globally, right? And, you know, you mentioned um, you know, the Asian countries where, you know, imagine China, the retail ownership is, is, is incredible in the public markets. It's, it's, it's you know, so, so sort of far ahead, many of the Western countries in terms of actual retail ownership. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I would love to sort of see our technology reach those markets soon. Um, but obviously to do that, we need the right partnerships. Um, but you know, look, you look at GameStop, okay? And we know what it all turned into and, and it, it became this whole thing and a retail movement and so on. But I was watching the Senate hearings recently and, um, and my favorite quote that came out of it was from Roaring Kitty, the, you know, you all know who he is. And, and he said, look, I, um, I grew up shopping at GameStop and I continue shopping there. And I heard that and I started thinking, okay, look, at its heart, at its core, this was a community movement. So it was an individual, a group of individuals that cared about GameStop. It saw it being attacked and it was trying to protect it. And then it grew into something else and something bigger and different. This is not about whether GameStop saga was good or bad, but that emotive reaction 
can, can't, won't happen to an ETF or passive. It'll happen to a, a company that has a community around it that, you know, and that that's being harnessed. So I guess that community movement is, is, is something really big and we're going to see it over and over again in the public space. That's wonderful. Um, I think we're just about running out of time. So my, my final question to you is, uh, Will we be seeing primary bid present in Southern Europe, whether that's Spain or Portugal? Is there a time for that? Yes, very. It, look, we have a very strong and powerful relationship, um, strategic agreement with Euronext. Uh, we'll be launching in France uh, in the coming weeks, and we're fully regulated in France. This allows us to passport our permissions across um, continental Europe, and our agreement with Euronext covers nine geographies in continental Europe. So. We are uh, very excited about our pan-European launch. We think, you know, this movement around individuals and people in public markets is not just, as I said, a, a, a UK thing or a US thing. It's very much a, a global thing. And um, I'm excited about what we're about to do in continental Europe. Fantastic. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to us. Likewise, great speaking as always. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, uh, I am being really inspired and, and with many thoughts to continue after the session with all the conversations that we've had today and with the startups. And uh, still the day hasn't finished. We have right now a really sweet moment for me. Let me welcome to the stage uh, Maria Benjomea. Maria, welcome again. We are here with all our friends from and all the And we want country. a picture with all the friends. And we want to I take a picture. I can't go without the picture with all the friends. <laughs> so let's, uh, we are connected here and I think this is like a perfect We cannot embrace, but like uh, if we were doing it, eh? <laughs> we are gonna take a selfie. We ask everybody please to activate your cameras. We are taking a selfie, a smile. Yeah, again. here we are all um, again, all together one, and embracing. One, two. Three. Three! Yay! <laughs> Great. We will send to all of you and, of course, to all our attendees. Well, you, you start. Okay, and now for the next part of the session. We will have a conversation with two former uh, winners and participants of South Summit. You know, South Summit is a big family. We connect, we see people grow. And a good example of these are the two startups that will be conversating today with Maria Benjumea. Let me welcome from Citum Technologies, the CEO, Victor Alvarez. Victor, hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me, right? Yes, we can hear hello, you. Hello, Victor. And then hello. We, let's welcome uh, from Valeran, the co-founder and CBO, Michael Bardi. Hello, Michael. I leave you Hello, both <laughs> together in the best hands of Maria. <laughs> Hello, Victor. Hello, Michael. Well, it's absolutely great to be with you here because as Marisol has just said, and you all know, we are a big family and you are the best because you've been the finalist of the different edition of South Summit. And we really want to know how you are doing. And that's uh, the most important. I remember perfectly when you, Victor, were at South Summit. And uh, I remember when Michael, you were, because he won uh, the most disruptive uh, startup in, 19, in 2019. How is your leg, Michael? Because I remember you going up with your broken leg, something happened to you. I hope you are absolutely great now. Well, I think that nobody best than them to tell us what their companies do. Yes, 30 seconds, because we are startups. We are, yes, going on. So, Victor, what is, uh, what is Citun doing? <laughs> Well, Citon is an indoor positioning service to create uh, mobile applications that help us navigate inside large buildings with millions of visitors. Uh, for example, you can download uh, an application for Madrid or Barcelona airport to find the path to your boarding gate if you are lost in the airport. That application will have uh, our technology. But Citum can also track uh, security or facility workforces uh, to audit the service that they are providing in that building. Examples include, for example, measuring uh, the movement of forklift inside factories. 
Great, Victor. And uh, what about you, Michael? And yeah, what well, about Valorant? Well, thank you for having me back. Yeah, so Valorant is essentially the palantir for infrastructure managers. We help private organizations that manage roads, the largest infrastructure on earth, acquire, analyze, and, this, and leverage all the different data sets they have so that their roads and traffic are safer, more efficient, so we have less congestion, less emissions, less accidents, and they in turn make more profits from their toll roads. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Victor, how has Situn evolved since you participated in South Summit? Well, we changed a lot. <laughs> I can remember, yeah, I remember my first participation in South Summit. I would barely consider ourselves as a startup because we were just a group of people uh, that came from the university. We were all researchers. There was no commercial team, no customer team. Uh, so I wouldn't say we were a startup yet. <laughs> and well, things changed a lot. We are now 35 in our team. There's obviously a company behind this name, behind Citroen. We help thousands and thousands of people find their way in uh, airports, shopping malls, hospitals, across several uh, countries like Japan, Singapore, or Thailand. So I would say it changed a lot. That's great, Victor, and doing very well because you stayed one second time in uh, 2018, so the growth uh, is really very, very good. And Michael, how about you? Because we know that you are working to bring satellite connectivity to all roads. How are you so doing? We're look, yeah, well, so we're looking to bring uh, more than that. It's connectivity and, and data analytics uh, based on all data sources to all roads. And since then, actually, one of the big things that South Summit did is it's actually opened up uh, Spain, Iberia as one of our biggest markets. So whilst at South Summit, we met two of our biggest clients that we're now working with. And, and we have now actually projects in, in Madrid and in Galicia and uh, planning more so in, in, in Portugal and with uh, partners in South America and North America, thanks to the South Summit. Except that we've grown our team. We recently just signed or closed our Series A and have expanded, thanks to our, our product portfolio to include a direct connectivity with uh, vehicles. Thank you, Michael. Uh, well, for both, but uh, Victor, I think that we've lived, we are living because we, it hasn't passed yet, no? but we are living uh, difficult moments. How do you think that this year and the pandemic has affected the industry, your industry? Well, Citroen's uh, technology is uh, multi-vertical in the sense that it can be applied to many different types of buildings. But an important industry that we are into is the travel industry. Uh, you know, airports, uh, hotels, resorts. So as you can imagine, it has affected us a lot. Uh, this industry is for now frozen. I mean, no one's moving there. <laughs> But uh, things are changing quite fast, and luckily, uh, other industries are uh, pushing hard uh, so that we can still increase our revenue, even if the situation is not as good as we would like to. And for you, uh, Michael, for Valoran, do, have you noticed so, uh, big changes in your in your business yeah. during this yeah, so year? I I hope so it I think has there have affected been, you well. <laughs> sorry. So I think I think there have been some some changes that have been disruptive. You know, uh, some supply chains are uh, are less reliable than they used to be. You can't meet people in person. But I think the most amazing change I can tell by by an anecdote. So Valorant's first client in the U.S. Uh, was signed on in 2017, and to get that client, I needed to move to the U.S. for four months and have our IT team come every month to work with their IT teams to actually make the project happen. Whilst the newest customer we've had also in the US, we've done completely remotely. So we've done all the integration work with all their systems remotely. We've done all the meetings remotely. We never met in person. And I think whilst obviously a lot has been disrupted, 
but the like the massive leap that we've made in terms of our ability to engage digitally is a super huge win to startups uh, because it really allows us now to engage with clients all over the world. <laughs> and for both, where are the next steps for you, for your company and the goals for 2021? Any of you, you can answer any of you. Well, I, I let him start. <laughs> Michael. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. This so, is your time. <laughs> thank you. Well, so we have actually, uh, we're now working with uh, three, fingers crossed, four uh, Lighthouse clients. And, the, and these clients are, we're doing now large scale projects where we're actually uh, in complete control of full, of full large scale assets that serve millions of people a year. And if these work, then we stand to become the in-house solution for large portfolios of roads. So each one of these clients has uh, 20, 30 roads spanning five to 10,000 kilometers uh, in total. And we're hoping in 2021 to start becoming in-house uh, de facto solutions for these large portfolios. And that will show A, the ability to scale in this industry, which is something that's been a challenge up to now, but B, the massive impact that our solution has compared to the existing solutions in the market. Great, Victor, and you? Well, we are now in a, uh, in a uh, stage where we have to triple every uh, KPI in the company. So growth, growth, and growth. <laughs> That's the situation where we are now. But we also have interesting plans in terms of product. Uh, since we are helping many buildings uh, with their navigation uh, applications, we want to also help them in every other aspect of their building, like help their employees, help uh, the people that go to that building, help everyone as long as you yes, enter the building. So we want to become like an intelligent building solution. Victor, Michael, Situn, Valerian, we are so proud of you, the work you are doing, how you are making grow and grow your companies. And uh, we all, South Summit team, and I think all the ecosystem wish you the best because I'm sure you're going to be really great. No, you are doing great and you are going to do it much greater. So thank you very, very much. Thank you a lot for the invitation. Thank you. Maria, this was an amazing conversation. Um, and you know, this is for us uh, one of the sweet moments of the day because we now know that the jury has voted and we are waiting to hear who is the winner. Are you ready? Play a drum roll in your home. You can just bang against the table and create the right suspense for the moment. Maria, and are we ready to say the winner? And the winner is... Well, I think... Do you, who do you identify who can be the winner? Because the winner and the winner is Risk. Risk Ledger. Uh, Ashley Mitchell connected today from the UK and they give organizations all the tools they need to run a comprehensive cyber security led third party risk management program against their entire supply chain at speed and at scale while making it simple, free, and fast for third parties to engage with the process to improve their risk management maturity. Ashley, welcome, congratulations, and let's celebrate together. Yeah, Woo! so I'm sure you want to say something. First, Ashley, first I want to say to everybody, to all the other four, that you five has been absolutely great. You've done great and you have great companies. But now, Ashley, I'm sure you want to say something. Uh, thank you so much. Um, muchas gracias. Uh, I practice a little bit of my Spanish there. It's, you know, it's like we've mentioned several times um, during the event, it's been such a, a strange time over the last year. 
And so I want to thank um, uh, Virtual South Summit for putting on the ev event and managing to make it work out, even though there's been some technical difficulties. I want to say well done to all of the other startups that pitched as well. I was really engrossed and I, I felt some of the energy um, um, from you ladies on the stage just being excited by all of the innovation that's, <laughs> that's happening. So thank you so much to all of the jury. I really appreciate it. For anybody who didn't understand what we pitched, I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn and show you a little bit more. Or anyone who wants to buy, I'm up for that as well. <laughs> thank that's you, great, Sam. That's great, That's great, absolutely. And thank and you then, to everyone. And, and you know, Ashley, that everybody can continue asking you questions because you will be part of our uh, uh, South Summit Encounter in October. And you will be pitching because that's part of the privilege of being the it's winner from today. You know, this is a perfect example of what South Summit is. South Summit is, as I have said many times today, a family. South Summit is the energy of this amazing woman. South Summit is the value the of the startups that have connected today from all over the world and of our juries. We, you can see that we had so many important and interesting people from all around the world, from different sectors and different perspectives. And I want to emphasize one thing that we are all connected because we say in South Summit that innovation is business. We are looking for practical ideas that are for immediate use, and we want each of you to connect and bring business and innovation to the table because we are building a better world together. Maria, this is an amazing day. Now, the next is that we will connect for our next virtual South Summit. Yeah. We will be talking about the MENA region and it will be as exciting and powerful and connected as the session today. Yeah, and innovation, as you say, innovation is business, but innovation is people, and business and people is all we are here, our investor, our startups, the great company, that all together we are making this new world much better. And we are here. We are in this war room, we are in IE University, and uh, because innovation is only training, because we have to be changing our mind day by day, always. So with this spirit from the IE University that we work with liquid learning from everywhere and in everywhere, we are waiting for you for the 7th of April, and here we will be with the MENA region, talking about the innovation in the Middle East and North Africa region. So, be ready to connect and we will wait for you. I'm from Madrid, I'm from Spain, and thank you very much to all of you, to all our friends from the jury, from the startups, and from you all. Thank you very much, and just looking forward to see you very, very soon. And happy Easter for everyone. Bye-bye, see you.